This is a demonstration of Wirecast. 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 This is a demonstration of Wirecast.
is a demonstration of Wirecast. This 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 is a demonstration of Wirecast. is a demonstration of Wirecast. is a demonstration of Wirecast. This is a demonstration of Wirecast. This is a demonstration of Wirecast.
This is a demonstration of Wirecast. of Wirecast. This is a demonstration of Wirecast. Good morning. Welcome to God's house. A pleasure to be here with all of you today. There is a difference between our perspective on this world and the things that happen in our life versus God's perspective on this world and the things that happen in our life. And that's what we're going to be thinking about today and contemplating today is, is why does God, the biggest question in the world that people ask all the time, why does God, an all-powerful God and all-loving God, allow so much evil and suffering in this world? So today we're going to be focusing on trust. Um, in our lessons, our hymns, and our sermon, we're going to be thinking about trusting in a God, remembering who He is, and at the same time remembering who we are. Let's begin our worship service today with the opening hymn, uh, a hymn that's focusing on trust, hymn 414. We'll sing the first two verses of that. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. 
is a demonstration of why holy I and merciful you. father i confess that i am by nature sinful and that i have disobeyed you in my thoughts words and actions i have done what is evil and failed to do what is good for this i deserve your punishment both now and in eternity but i am truly sorry for my sins and trusting in my savior jesus christ i pray lord have mercy on me a sinner God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by His authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O Lord, our God, govern the nations on earth and direct the affairs of this world so that your church may worship you in peace and joy. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our first scripture reading for today comes from the book of Acts, chapter 27. In this lesson, we're reminded that when all seems lost, it's God's promises that take away our fear 
administration and give us hope. Wirecast. When a gentle south wind began to blow, they saw their opportunity, so they weighed anchor and sailed along the shore of Crete. Before very long, a wind of hurricane force called the Northeaster swept down from the island. The ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind, so we gave way to it and were driven along. As we passed to the lee of a small island called Cauda, we were hardly able to make the lifeboat secure. So the men hoisted it aboard. Then they passed ropes under the ship itself to hold it together because they were afraid they would run aground on the sandbars of Sirtis. They lowered the sea anchor and let the ship be driven along. We took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. After they had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would have spared yourselves this damage and loss. But now I urge you to keep up your courage, because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me and said, Do not fear. Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. This is the word of our Lord. We'll continue with the song from our soloist. This is a demonstration of Wirecast. is a demonstration of Wirecast. This is a demonstration of Wirecast. is a demonstration of Wirecast. This is a demonstration of Wirecast. This is a demonstration of Wirecast.
Please stand. The gospel for today comes from Mark chapter 4, starting at verse 35. In this lesson, Jesus shows his power even over nature to remove our fears from any difficulty that we have to face. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. This is is the gospel of of our Lord. Be to you, O Christ, praise be to you, O Christ. Let's Let's confess our faith together using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life for the world to come. Amen. Please be seated for the hymn of the day.
administration of Wirecast. Please stand. <clears throat> Our sermon text for today comes from Job chapter 38. Then the Lord spoke to God, or then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. He said, Who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set? Or who laid its cornerstone? While the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouting for, shouted for joy, who shut up the sea behind doors when it burst forth from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment and wrapped it in thick darkness, when I fixed limits for it and set its doors and bars in place, when I said, this far you may come and no farther, here is where your proud waves halt. This is the word of our Lord. Please be seated. This is a demonstration of Wirecast. There was a survey taken recently among young people, and, and there was just one question on it. And the question was, if you could ask God one question, and he would have to answer you, what question would you ask him? Want to guess what the number one question was that people wanted to ask God? The number one question was, why would an all-powerful and all-loving and all-wise God allow such evil and problems in this world in my life? That's the question they wanted to ask. And I don't think any of you are, are thinking, wow, I, ne I never thought about that question before. It's a question that many people have thought about, not just in our generation, but for thousands of years. And what we have in our lesson is probably the first time where we see this discussion, this, this thought process going on of people, of human beings, trying to understand why God would allow evil and suffering in this world. We see that here in our lesson in Job. So before we get into our lesson, which is chapter 38 of Job, we need to set the context and understand what happened to Job so that we get to where we are in our lesson for today. And we go back to chapter 1 and 2 in the, in, in the book of Job, and it begins by talking about who Job is. And it says that he is the greatest man among the people of the East. And it describes that by saying that he is rich, absolutely rich. It says that he has thousands of camels, thousands of sheep, hundreds of donkey, hundreds of, of oxen. He had children, he had servants, he had everything. He was rich. And then in a moment, it's all taken away. And I want to read that to you. It's not going to be up on the big screen but I'm going to read this. This comes from Job chapter 1, which sets the scene. And as I read this, I want you to think about what it would have been like if you would have been watching Job receiving these messages that he receives. Job chapter 1 says, A messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys were grazing nearby, and the Sabaeans attacked and made off with them. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The fire of God fell from the heavens and burned up the sheep and the servants, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The Chaldeans formed three raiding parties and swept down on your camels and made off with them. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, yet another messenger came and said, Your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house when suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house. It collapsed on them, and they are all dead, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. It didn't take years or months or weeks or even minutes. It took seconds for Job, the richest man in the world, the Bill Gates of the ancient world, to lose everything. He lost it all. 
And maybe some of you have experience with that in the sense of you can, men, you can think of a moment in your life where you knew that because of what just happened, it's going to change your life forever. Because someone died. Or someone had a bad diagnosis. Someone got cancer. Someone had Alzheimer's. Someone was getting divorced. Someone had an accident. Someone got hurt. And you knew your life would change forever. This is a demonstration of why. So, for the next 37 chapters, it's Job and his three friends contemplating why God would allow something like this to happen in his life. And, and Job, he has some really awful, terrible friends who finally come up to him, and their main conclusion is, Job, you must have done something horribly wrong for God to allow this to happen in your life. God is obviously punishing you for something. Just repent of that sin, whatever it is. And Job stuck to his story. He's like, no, there's nothing in particular that I did recently that God would allow all these things to happen in my life. And Job is tired of the things that his friends are saying. And yet at the same time, Job wants to question God and get an explanation for the things that are happening in his life. And then God does something that no one ever thinks God would ever do. He speaks. And he doesn't speak to Job to explain himself and help him to understand why all these horrible things happened to him in a moment. But he reminds him who he is. That he is the all-powerful God and he doesn't have to answer to anyone. Rather, he questions Job. And here's the first question that he asks, a question that he could ask any one of us any day of the week. He says, Who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? How often do we speak with words without knowledge? How often do you speak with confidence and authority on something that you know absolutely nothing about? Oh, I think we all do this all the time. In fact, I had a friend in college who was notorious for this. It didn't matter if the conversation was about sports or history or cooking or how to catch bass in the Mississippi River. He would speak as if he was the foremost authority on any topic. And we all know he didn't know what he was talking about. But we do that all the time, don't we? Speak with words without knowledge. But yet it becomes most detrimental when we speak with words without knowledge, when it has to do with the things of God. When you try to explain with our puny mind why God would allow this or that going on in this world or in my life. And it gets to the point where people start questioning God, just like Job's friends did, just like Job did, Shaking their fist at God, saying, God, why would you allow this to happen in my life or in the world? Because if you would have done it this way, if I were God, I would have done it this way and it would have turned out better. Or how often do you have prayers sometimes which you want to end by saying, Lord, not your will be done, but my will be done. Because this is the best and only solution to the problem. So make it happen. And what happens here is... It's a lack of trust in God. It's not recognizing who God is as the all-powerful, all-loving God. Instead of trusting him, we want to put that responsibility on our own shoulders, and so all of a sudden we begin to feel afraid or worried or overwhelmed or stressed. And if that were the only result, so be it. But it's not. You see, not trusting in God is sin. And there have been more than a few people who have lost their faith as they demanded from God an explanation for why this or that happened in their life or in the world, and they didn't get one. That's why we need to talk about this. Job's friends have forgotten about who God is. And we do too sometimes. But God has not forgotten who he is. And that's why he speaks to Job in the way that he does. He says this in our lesson. Brace yourself like a man. 
I will question you and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set? Or who laid its cornerstone? God's point in saying this to Job is to say, listen, I am the architect, the surveyor, and the engineer. I created this world. That's who I am. Who are you? And then he goes on to say, did you hear when the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy? The Hebrew here for angels is actually translated sons of God. Uh, the translators, when, when we look at this verse, the morning stars and the sons of God are referring to the angels. See, so usually when people say, well, when were the angels created? We figure they were created sometime when everything else was created in the first six days of creation. But this verse would have us understand that the, the angels were probably created within the first few days of creation. So that on day three, which is being talked about here, when the dry land was being formed, when the seas were being formed, it was the angels who watched the Lord as he created created all of the world and saying praises to the Lord. And the Lord says to Job, did you hear them sing? Because I did, because I was there. Where were you? And the Lord's point in all this is to simply remind Job who he is. He says, remember who I am as the Lord, the all-powerful creator of the universe, and remember who you are. You are the creation, I am the creator. Remember who you are. The Lord's point is to simply humble Job and at the same time help him understand who he is as the all-powerful, all-loving, all-wise God. He continues on. It says, Who shut up the sea behind doors when it burst forth from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment and wrapped it in thick darkness, when I fixed limits for it and set its doors and bars in place, when I said, this far you may come and no farther, here is where your proud waves halt. The Lord's point here is to simply say, I am the one who told the sea, this is where the beach is going to be. This is where the dry land is going to start and stop. That's who I am. And so in chapter 38, there are it says 42 scientific questions that the Lord asked to Job, and in total, 77 questions in all that the Lord asked Job, all of which Job does not know the answer to, and all of which the Lord does know the answer to because of who he is. And you can almost imagine Job slouching and slouching in his seat like a student in the principal's office as he's starting to realize what he did by questioning the all-powerful and all-wise God. But the Lord's point here is not to puff up his chest, flex his muscles at Job, to intimidate him or to intimidate us. His point is to simply say to Job, I got this. I know you don't think I'm in control of the world, but I am. I'm doing just fine. So that cancer diagnosis that you just found out about, the Lord knew about a long time ago that surprised death in your family, then the Lord knew that that was coming. That's not a surprise to him. That natural disaster that happened on the other side of the world, the Lord knew about that. Remember who the Lord is. He is the all-powerful God, and we are simply the creation. And when we look at creation, when we understand who our God is, we recognize his power, his wisdom, and his love. And we do the same thing. We recognize that as well, and maybe even more so when we look at the story of our salvation. We look at what our God did for us. We've been talking about Genesis chapter 1. If you move forward to Genesis chapter 3, we see the fall into sin of Adam and Eve. And what happens immediately after Adam and Eve fall into sin. The Lord is there already in verse 15 with a promise. It says, I'm going to crush Satan's head. And he doesn't tell them any of the details. He doesn't tell them when the Savior is going to come, what his name is even going to be. He doesn't talk about the details of the Pharisees and how it's going to lead to Christ's crucifixion and how three days later he's going to rise from the dead. He spares them the details and simply says, I'm going to fix it, trust me. Of Wirecast. And they did. And he did. He sent that Savior. Now, I have no doubt that years later, 
There have been plenty of people who are waiting for that Messiah to come, who thought to themselves, boy, where is this Messiah that the Lord is going to send? Maybe even started to worry that maybe the Lord forgot about us. And all the while as they were wor- worrying, the Lord was not. And the Lord was building up and tearing down other kingdoms so that Christ could come at the right time and the right place. And he did. It's a reminder to us of the power and wisdom and love of our God as we look at the story of our salvation. We can never understand the complexity of the plan. There are so many questions that we have for God. We want to know why he allowed this or that to happen in our life or this or that to happen in the world. And God doesn't tell us the details of that. But there is one thing that you need to know. And that's Christ and who he is. That our Savior Jesus did not come into this world just to be a good example for you because we needed more than an example. We needed a substitute. We needed someone who wouldn't question God like we do who trusts in God unlike we do. And that's exactly who Jesus is. Think about Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, what happened to him there, as he knew the type of suffering that was going to be coming up in just a few moments, and he has a prayer to God. He says, Lord, if there's another way to do that, let's do this. But then he prays one of the greatest, most boldest prayers ever when he says, your will be done, not mine. And he went to that cross for you. You may not know why God allows this or that in this world or in your life, but you do know this, that because of Christ, you are forgiven, and you will spend eternity in heaven with him forever. That's what you need to know. This is a and that causes us to rest in the hands and arms of a loving heavenly father. In Genesis chapter 1, The very first verse, the Bible begins with this. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the very next verse goes on to say, the earth was formless and empty. God had created this massive, ugly, massive matter. It was chaos. But then, through the six days of creation, he was going to, like an artist with a piece of clay in front of him, form it into something beautiful in the next six days. And he did. Chaos turned into something beautiful and perfect. Three chapters later, in Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve ruined this creation, brought chaos into our hearts, the Lord saw that and made a promise So that through Christ, the chaos would turn into perfection and something beautiful for us. And if the Lord did that in creation, and if the Lord did that through Christ for our souls, don't you think he can do that for the relatively small problems that we have going on in our life or in this world? Most definitely. This last week I was on a it's on a plane, and it's, it's always funny to see, watch, look around at people during takeoff, this right? Because there's some people who are so used Christ. to flying, they're, they're passed out, they're just sleeping, right? There's other people who are white-knuckling those armchairs, and they are sweating, they are nervous, right? And it doesn't matter whether you are afraid, you are nervous, or completely asleep, it doesn't matter about how you get to your destination. What matters is the pilot and the integrity of the airplane. Same thing is true for our own lives. It doesn't matter how worried or nervous you may be about the things going on in your life or in this world. This is a demonstration we of have an all powerful, all wise, and all loving God who is guiding us through this life and into the next. Let's remember who He is. Amen. Please stand. Let's sing together the Create in Me.
please be seated for the offering. During the offering, we please ask you to sign and pass the friendship registers, especially if you're a visitor here today. We'd love to talk with you more about the incredible things that our Savior has done for us. Thank you. This is a demonstration of Wirecast. Demonstration of Wirecast. of Wirecast. of Wirecast. This is a demonstration of Wirecast. I want to direct your attention to the worship card. And on the back side, you see the, the special prayers that are there. A couple of changes to that. One is that uh, Pastor Caleb Shanig has, uh, as of yesterday, he declined the call to, to come here to be our pastor. Uh, we have not discussed a, another call meeting yet, but we'll, we'll get one scheduled and let you know about that in the future. Um, also, one, another addition to this is that John, Bedru John Benrude's mother passed away this last week, uh, and we'll keep uh, the family of, well, it's Regina May Matthews passed away this last week. The funeral will be this Friday at 11 a.m. at the Schumacher Kish uh, Funeral Home in Onalaska. Uh, visitation from 10 to 11. Uh, and we also want to pray for Justin Wintrone, who um, on Friday received a call, an emergency call to serve at St. John's in Libertyville, Illinois, uh, as the, the uh, seventh and eighth grade teacher. He has until just Tuesday to decide on that. So pray, we'll pray for him now, continue praying for him in the next few days, and if you get a chance, talk to him about that as well. We pray.
Lord God, we know that our ways are not your ways. Our thoughts are not your thoughts. You've taught us to pray according to your will and not our own. You've told us to trust in your power, wisdom, and love, even as we see problems in the world and in our life unfolding all the time. Give us a stronger trust in you. Help us to be confident in your control of this world in order to take away our fears and anxiety of everything that we see around us. Point us to Christ, who removes our sins of doubt and is a reminder of your power, wisdom, and love. We thank you for caring for Sandy Hunter and Darlene Leeds who are hospitalized and have since been released. Help them in their recovery. Strengthen them physically and spiritually according to your will. We thank you for all those who are celebrating a wedding anniversary, including Herb and Evidel Krause celebrating 60 years, Dave and Ann Johnson celebrating Jansen celebrating 48 years, and Jean and Betty Falkenberg celebrating 62 years. Continue to bless them as you have in the past. Help them to see Christ's self-sacrificing love for them as the motivation for their self-sacrificing love for each other. And the Lord God, Lord of life and death, we thank you for all the mercies with which you blessed our fellow believer, Regina May Matthews, now fallen asleep. We thank you especially for having brought her to the knowledge of your son, Jesus Christ. We pray that you would comfort her family and all who mourn her death with your precious promises and cheer them with a sure hope of a blessed reunion in heaven. Grant the lifeless body rest and at last, together with us all, a joyful resurrection to life everlasting. Teach us to number our days aright, that we may gain hearts of wisdom and finally be saved through Jesus Christ, our risen and ever-living Lord. And Lord God, we ask you to be with Justin Wintrone as he deliberates the call to either return back to MLC for his last year or to teach at Libertyville, Illinois, the grades 7 to 8. We ask you to give him wisdom and give him a confident answer um, so that he can, knowing that either answer is a way that you are blessing him. In your name we pray all of this. Amen. This is a Please stand for the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. This is a Amen. Of Wirecast. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God through Jesus Christ our Lord, who promised that wherever two or three come together in his name, there he is with them to shepherd his flock till he comes again in glory. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. 
The peace of the Lord be with you always. This is a demonstration of Wirecast. 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 is a demonstration of Wirecast.
Wirecast. of Wirecast.
please stand. We'll sing together a song of thanksgiving, the song of Simeon. A servant now depart according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for every people, a light to light in the Gentiles. And the glory, the glory of your people, Israel. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Oh, God the Father, source of all goodness, in your loving kindness you sent your Son to share our humanity. We thank you that through him you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. We also pray that you will not forsake us, but will rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, so that we will willingly serve you day after day. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you peace. Amen. Please be seated for our closing hymn. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you today. Uh, there's a couple of announcements. You have another, a number of things in your bulletin. I'll let you read those on your own. One thing I did want to highlight is, um, I take it back, two things. One thing is uh, uh, next week we're going to be starting a sermon series as well as a Bible study series on the books of the Bible that most people don't really know about or don't really read, the Minor Prophets. They're the last books of the Bible in the Old Testament, those shorter books. Some are only a chapter long. So we're going to dig into those week after week. We're going to look at another one. We'll have a sermon on it and then a Bible study uh, in the, between services. So please join us for that. Um, also, Starting Point is the name of our Bible class uh, that we that really goes into. I'm not going to say it's a basic Bible study, but it is a foundational Bible study, and it's mainly targeted for your friends and your coworkers and your family members who need to hear about Jesus. All of you know. Well, most of you, I'm going to say all of you, probably know someone who needs to know about Jesus, whose spiritual life is not even there or is really struggling. Uh, this is a great class for them that we get to just start from the beginning as far as what is the Bible, what is this church all about. Uh, so that begins tomorrow, uh, Monday night, 6.30 is when we're going to do it. If that time doesn't work, but you know someone who might be interested, let me know anyways. I am 
I am incredibly flexible with, with this class um, because it is, in my opinion, one of the most important things that we do here at St. Paul's. So if you have somebody, um, there are many ways that you can invite your friends, talk to them about Jesus yourself. You can invite them to church. This is another opportunity. Invite them to this Bible class called Starting Point. Starts tomorrow night at 6.30. It's also a great opportunity for if, if you haven't taken a Bible class since your 8th grade confirmation year, might be time for a refresher, a little review. We'd love to have you in that. I had somebody in the last um, an hour ago told me that they're going to be in it um, because they just want to be refreshed on some of the main doctrines uh, that, that we believe in. So, so we'd love to have you there. Take some time to greet those people who are around you. If you don't know somebody, if you uh, don't know a face, please introduce yourself. God's blessings on your week.